watching Property TV. Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galvin and this is the show where you're going to have your property related questions answered by a team of property experts. And joining me today is Sally Wang, who is um, CEO and founder of SJW UK Property Investments Limited. Sally, welcome to you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Mm -hmm. Looking very beautiful, if I may say so, in your blue dress. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Okay, and um, Daniel, no such compliments for you, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, but uh, Daniel is Sales Director of Secure Property Investments, and um, now your second show. Welcome back. Thank you. Okay, good to see you both. Let's start off with Sally then. When building a portfolio of rental property, do the panel think it better to have the properties close to hand, or is it acceptable and sensible these days with good internet connections and dedicated software? to invest further afield? Mm -hmm. um, Stephen, 99% of my buyers, they don't live in this country. So, I mean, technology and, and also the communication uh, softwares we could use nowadays is incredible. So, I mean, the key point for any buy to lend investors is to find the right product. And if you find the right product, I mean, distance now is not um, a problem. Never, and in COVID, everybody's working from home. You know, they work remotely. So even when you're living in London, um, you know, you, you can still function by not working from the office, which means remotely. So why do you put a limitation on buying and managing a property? So, you know, we have been in the industry. I have been doing this for 10 years. From day one, I'm selling properties. Uh, to buyers who are not even living in this country. So for me, the answer is find your right products. This is the key and leave the rest to the professionals. Find the person who can sell your property remotely and who can let the manager and resell your property remotely, then problem solved. Mm. OK, well, I, I, I get that, Sally, but you must remember in London for a long time, well, I suppose right throughout the UK, yeah. there was a sort of feeling that if the properties were sort of almost touchable and close to you, it was easier to build your team of, uh, or your support team, if you like, your, your, your builders, your maintenance men, your letting agent and so forth. And to some extent, at that time, it was rather more difficult to get people, say, for instance, if you were a London investing in Liverpool, difficult to understand the quality of the people you were appointing up there and maybe. But as you rightly say, with good communication today, with good internet, with the ease of which you can check people out these days, I think I think that's really the key. And your your point, if you find the right agent and the right person to depend on, then you you should be okay. Do you agree with that, Daniel? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, <clears throat> um, when you're investing in in property, it is about the return you're getting, whether that's from the capital appreciation or the yield. So ultimately the property could be on the moon if, if it's working for you financially yeah it doesn't matter where it is um yes there's, there's he's going to start selling properties on the moon <laughs> i just see a rise light uh, new new market new appearing market on the way, yeah. Um, so yeah you know yes there is research that you have to do to make sure you've got the right agents in place in the area that you're buying uh, but that's pretty easy to do. And, and the beauty of buy to let is you can buy anywhere. So, yes, I, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't disagree with anything Sally said there. It, it, it can be done. And do you think that applies to to HMOs? I mean, I, I, I've never really been involved with sort of HMO business, but it occurs to me that with single room letting and, and multiple people in the same building, then your, your turnover of tenants and that sort of thing is going to be a lot greater. Mm. So do you think there's any merit in doing that a little bit closer to hand or? I mean, there are agents that will specialise in HMOs for sure. So yes, you can still purchase those kind of properties, um, you know, at a distance. I think for landlords that want to self-manage, 
and, and obviously self-managing a HMO is, is quite a time consuming exercise. Uh, and I think full time landlords will perhaps do that and, and, and benefit from, from having something a little bit closer to home. But someone that wants to be a little bit more hands off again, you know, doesn't really matter where it is as long as they've got the right team to manage and, and yeah. deal with that property. That, that's fine. And your point about software is quite interesting, too. I mean, there, there are some, some amazing packages out there now, aren't there, which mm -hmm. e even the smaller landlord can probably afford to to purchase or subscribe to. So I think software is a, a huge key element these yeah, days, agree. isn't it? OK, good. Well, thank you both for that. Daniel. I understand that properties, i.e. buy-to-let investments, cannot be part of a formal pension plan. However, I presume that there is nothing to stop me having buy-to-let properties and using the rental income to, to provide regular income in my retirement. Can the experts give me any guidance with, with regard to this idea? And are there any uh, disadvantages in doing this um, in so much as what I've suggested, which is to use property as an income supplement rather than a formal pension? Yeah, um, nothing to stop someone doing that at all. Um, you can buy commercial property and put that in a in a SIP in a self invested pension plan. Um, but but residential properties are a no no. It would just need to be bought in personal name or, or limited company. But the income that's derived from that, um, absolutely nothing to stop that that income, um, you know, being utilised as a you know form of of, of living expense. Um, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, given the fact that we need um, rental stock. Um, do, do you think this policy is wrong? Do you think we should be allowed to create pension funds with property? Um, that's a very good question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I, I, I think it would... Um, I can't see what the downside is for the government, really. I just, I just don't get it. No. Um, I, I, it would certainly... Um, Personally, I think it would continue to fuel the market and fuel house prices. I think if you were able to to put property in pension, um, in private pensions, um, I, 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 I would see a lot of people taking advantage of that. Um, but yeah, um, I, I don't I don't see why that hasn't been looked at at this moment in time. So hold on, if I get you, if I get you straight, what, what what you're saying is is it's a good idea from the point of view of creating a pension fund, but it might aggravate property inflation. Quite possibly, because I think a lot of people would take advantage of it. But I just wonder if you could create situations where you had an effective pension plan using property, um, it might take the, the strain off your state pension requirements. It might it might help people to set themselves yeah. aside from that. Yeah, yeah, and that's a very good point. Um, I, I think there's always going to be pros and cons to, to anything that happens in the property market. Um, so yes, you might see property prices increase, but then the reliance on the state pension might then drop back a little bit. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, great point. I mean, that starts to come, doesn't it, to the to the same sort of arguments that sort of say, well, um, should a pensioner with, you know, either huge savings or, or supplemented income really be given the winter fuel allowance, for instance? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I suppose you can argue the entitlement business they paid in all their lives and why shouldn't they get what everybody else gets? On the other hand, if it's not near, really necessary and we're trying to help the people that really do need help, then, you know, there, there, there is an argument there, isn't there? Yeah. But it, I, I suppose it's all a question of balances. What do you think, Sally? Well, I think uh, um, from an individual point of view, of course, you know, as you said, a lot of people will take advantage of this because pension, you know, you have to be really old nowadays to be able to get the money out. And for people like me, even, you know, I only lived here for 20 years, but some people lived here for five years, 10 years, and we've been putting money, but then how much can we take out when, when we retire? So for us, seriously, for us, um, property is our pension plan. Um, but if pension, you know, can be used, can take property as pension plan, that's big advantage for us. And we will take advantage of that. But then for the government side, you know, reduce tax, you know, property price goes up. I'm just so happy that I'm not a politician. I don't have to make these tough decisions. <laughs> no, but you have to live by what they do decide. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. yeah, so I, um, just... Um, what I'd like to do at the end of the first half of the show, just ask your, your view on things. So, look, we're just getting to a stage now where we're going to have certainly a change round of leader and, and probably cabinet too. Um, just 30 seconds each. Is there something that you would like the government to do to 
help or assist the property market, whether it be at the lower end of first time buyers or, or higher up with pensions? Is, is the one thing that you'd like the government to do? Um, I think drop um, the increased stamp duty rate for investors. Um, I think that would be a, a, a major boost to the buy to let market that, that I work in. On one hand, it hasn't stopped people from investing because they see the long term benefits of property. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I think it's, um, you know, will be a cash flow boost to a lot of people. You know, stamp duty in London on, on an average purchase price is, is quite a lot of money. Um, and, and that would certainly give a, a you know, bit of an impetus to, to the market. And it's unfundable money too, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Sally, come on, here's your chance. Oh, well, I actually have a lot of requests. Um, <laughs> Just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I give you a couple. Okay. I give you a couple. Okay. We'll because go um, okay, so for we have uh, Chinese um, people. Like I think we probably represent a lot of immigrants who actually contribute to the com uh, to the country's economy. Like I'm, I'm pretty healthy. I don't use the NHS. I don't. But I'm still paying, you know, all the tax and all the pension. But I don't actually take any. I don't think I take that much from the government. Um, and then people like me now, I have my own business, I'm okay. But then people like me 10, 15 years ago, they just nearly uh, graduated to come to this country. They are contributing to the economy. Um, when they thinking of buying their first property in London, I think that's that's a very difficult thing for them to think of. How to buy, share ownership, those helps. Um, but I don't think there's enough stocks there. We always talk about supply and the demand. You know, supply is not meeting the demand. There's a lot of supply, but the supply is a high, it's expensive properties. There's a lot of, uh, I think expensive properties mm. are oversupplied. Mm. And then property that actually people can afford to buy is not enough. When we, when we help our help to buy um, Chinese young graduates, bright young graduates looking for homes in London, we can't find many options on the market for them that's suitable for them. So if, if the government can look at the labor market, you know, the skilled workers, we don't have that many skilled workers here. And then the cost of a building is going up. That's a strain for the developer, how to tackle this problem, right? And inflation is going up. Inflation goes up, you have to pay them salary, high salary, then the cost goes up again. You know, this is an endless root problem. So I mean, if the government can find a solution for the package to make building good quality, affordable house, not affordable house, affordable to the first time buyer for the bright young um, graduates, the generation that can actually bring the country, you know, to a better location, a better destination, if can help them to get on the property ladder, give them good quality properties. I think that's that's a, that's that's a good thing they can do okay, for this group of people. I'm but there's have a lot to stop of other you people. There, yeah. We've yeah. run out of time for this half yeah, of the show, so so I'm afraid you only got <laughs> yeah. one in, but I might yeah. give you a chance later in the show. Yeah, okay, okay yes, all right. People, yeah. Okay, well that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again, join Sally and Daniel again after the break. See you then. You are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Questions. I'm, I'm Stephen Galpin and I'm joined by Daniel Jackson and Sally Wang. Welcome back to you both. Sally, um, I'll be fair, I'll let you ask your second request to the government. Come on then, very quick. So uh, my second request, okay, how uh, I'm going to explain it in details and then see whether you can summarize it in uh, one sentence because I'm not good at it. Okay, so for I'm still looking at people in my group. Okay, we talk about people just graduated, um, young immigrants or local buyers, and then move on people at my age group. I'm in my early forties. I've been working very hard um, for other people. Then I set about my own business. So. I'm not coming from a rich family. I have I only come to this country with three thousand pounds. So and I can't I don't see that I can get out with pension when I'm getting older. This is this is honest, you know, mm. for my future. And there's not many investment products in the UK I can use. In China, you know, if you save money in the bank, you get a five percent return. That's a save an interest rate for saving. It's quite high, four to five percent. 
So if you don't do anything, you just save your money in the bank, you probably can help yourself to retire, have a good retirement life. But here, we don't have options. I don't understand stocks. I don't, I don't want to buy stocks because it's high risk. All I'm buying is property. That's all I'm buying. I'm buying not because I'm greedy, because I need to think for my own future. Nobody else is going to look out for me. I need to think the future for my parents, my husband, you know, the, the, my, my family. I need to think for them, provide for them a, a nicer future. When we retire, we don't have to worry about, you know, where are we going to pay for this meal? Where are we going to live? But then once we, when we buy property, we, get, we have to pay a lot of tax. So 40%, at least 40% is not ours. So I'm, I'm just like, you know, what's the point of working so hard? What's the point of I'm actually going to work and, and, and you know, provide for my future? Because half of my hardworking thing is not mine. And then am I thinking of going to another country? I, I don't know, you know, but this, this probably is... What you're saying is... we're a middle class. There's a, la there's a lack of incentive here, isn't there, to save and to invest? No, what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say that is the government now is... I don't think they're actually looking after the people that's middle class, which is the, I think is a big proportion of the country that actually can make the country become greater. And they are, look, they are not looking after the people who's maybe at a starting point, young graduates who just come to the world, need to find a job, need to start, start fresh and have, you know, build a future for them. So, but these people that, maybe it takes a bigger proportion of the whole population that you're not really looking after in some sense. But I mean, the government looking after us in, in other ways, like the furlough scheme and everything. That's very nice. NHS system in the UK is brilliant. This is really, really good. But then in the Wales, you know, everybody deserves to look after their family. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear how, how you're considering providing for your husband. I wish, I, wish, I got somebody <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I'd got somebody providing for me, don't that you, Daniel? Very, that would be very nice. <laughs> really yes, good. No, nice. no, 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 no. I, I just meant, you know, even as a husband and wife, you want to bring something back, contribute to, to, to the... You, you, you know, I don't want to spend my husband money. I was just going to so, suggest yeah. you get a divorce and come down here. <laughs> yeah. oh, this know. is brilliant. <laughs> no, I just, I okay, wrong, all right. Yeah. Now, I think we'll have to get on with the questioning now. So, Sally, your question is this. I'm currently remodeling a building in which I have six flats. My agent is considering marketing these in the Asia-Pacific areas for sale or rent um, when the work is complete. Mm -hmm. Can the international property experts give any tips in terms of attractive features that I should offer when signing off the designs of, of, of these apartments specifically for those markets? Um, floor plan. So let's talk about floor plan first. Floor plan, um, we like square. I think everybody probably, a um, lot of people, I think a big proportion of people like square um, floor plan, especially the, the Asian people, mm -hmm. international buyers, mm -hmm. floor, um, square. Um, I know some uh, architects or designers, they like to give the building different shapes. To well, you show know why that is, don't you, Sally? Do yeah. you know why? Mm. Architects get paid a percentage of the cost of building the building. Okay, <laughs> So if you build a square building, the costs are quite low. If you build a building with lots of corners, lots of curves, lots of odd <laughs> shapes, the costs go up and the architect's fees go up accordingly. <laughs> so mean, there the, you are. <laughs> the, the, the curves, the curves, are, I'm not so bothered about the curves. I'm just, you know, um, but if it is a triangle for the Chinese, it's not very good feng shui. Mm. And it's very difficult to put furniture in as well. And I think the size of the room um, needs to be, you know, reasonable, needs to be square. And nowadays, you do need a, a balcony, um, especially with what's going on now, balcony, outdoor space. Mm. And also, mm, the lighting needs to be important. Um, you know, I, I myself like floor to ceiling. When I'm selling property, floor to ceiling, I think if, you, if your development at a site that can enjoy a beautiful view, you really need to use that um, floor to ceiling windows. Or even when it's not floor to ceiling, but I still think a big proportion mm. of, of windows letting the lights in. Uh, the facing of the development is quite important as well. Um, so when you design the building, make sure you, know, you don't have that many flats facing north. You know, at least get, get the natural lights in. So that's the floor plan. And also not many wasted space. 
And when you look at the floor, not, not, not going have a very long corridor, um, maybe just open up a bit. And, you know, I, I can go into hours about this because we sell off plan. So all we sell is based on a you've piece of paper a, floor You've plan. got about a minute and a half. Okay, right. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to hurry up. And then the other thing I think is, is whatever you, because you know, as a developer, you know your building better than anybody else. What do you think is your best selling point? Why did you buy this piece of the land? You must have a reason, a logic behind when you make your decision. Pass that information on, but then make it, you know, very short and sweet. Not like me, okay, keep talking, but make it short and sweet. And then put in your brochure, put your factor sheets, and then to top that, you need to make videos, visual show them what it's going to look like visually and especially nowadays so that's that's my tip I, I can go on hours and hours because that's what we do we were giving a project it's just a hole on the ground sometimes it's not even a hole on the ground so my job is to look at the brochure i need to visualize it first if i can see it i can see i can sell it if i can't see it you know how i'm going to sell it to them and with a floor plan because i've I've started 10 years ago doing this job, starting selling off plan. Every single floor, you know, when I sell it, it's, it's, it's pure imagination. But when I get the key, enter this particular apartment, I see what I see and I can remember what I, what I had imagined in my mind, what I saw back then, I compare. Once I compare and I know, oh, back then I didn't see this. Now, with my experience, next time when I see something like this, I know, you know, what more I should be able to see with my uh, visionary eye. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much for that, Sally. So, um, Daniel, we'll move on to your question. I'm interested in investing in property for the first time, and I'd like some guidance on how I approach finding suitable off-market deals. I find that estate agents in general are always asking top prices and to make a portfolio produce a good yield, I need to find competitively priced properties. Any advice would be most welcome. Oof, yeah, um, I mean, going down the usual uh, traditional high street estate agency route will um, ultimately mean you're paying the market value and in this market, um, you know, probably a little bit more as well due to competition. So, you know, finding off market properties is, is pretty tough. Um, you know, the, the, the company that I work for, you know, we, we specialise in off market properties. We don't advertise on Zoopla or Rightmove. Um, so dealing with, you know, buy to let sourcing agents um, is probably the way forward, um, really, because you know the, the the kind of deals that we're able to 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 get from developers, receivers, banks, asset management companies, means that that we're able to to get some pretty good discounts for for clients. So yeah, going down the normal high street route, you know, the high street agents are working for the seller, and therefore are trying to get the best price for that for that client, whereas the the sourcing yes. agents like ourselves are, are working for the buyer. Well, I think that's an important point to remember, isn't it? It's, it's who the agent's working for. I mean, Absolutely. I know we go in to buy as a customer and expect good customer service, but you've got to remember they're on the other side. I mean, it's, it's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. But I mean, I, the, the other question I would just ask about that, um, Daniel, is we're talking about differences in price of maybe not a huge amount, probably. Mm. Does it matter? Because... You know, from my point of view, if you invest in property, you shouldn't be doing it for just five minutes or just a quick turnaround, unless yeah, that's your agreed. particular business. So if you pay two, three, four, five percent too much over a period of, let's say, five years or a 10 year investment strategy, does it really matter? Um, dependent on where you buy, you know, if you're in London, then two, three, four, five percent can can equate to a, you know quite a bit of money. Mm. If you can buy in at 10 or 15 percent below that, um, then, then you know, thanks very much. Great stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So, uh, again, I think it's very much area dependent because that will then determine exactly how much more you're going to be paying uh, and depends on the property as well. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I have to sit on the fence on that one a little bit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Anything to add, sir? No. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, well, we're at the end of the show. So, Sally Wang, founder and director of SJ. UK Property Investments and Daniel Jackson, Sales Director of Secure Property Investments. Thank you both very much for coming Thank in. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way down from Manchester. That's My pleasure. Really, really a brave move. <laughs> Sally, you've only come across the water, so, yeah. you know, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> in my high heels, so it's quite difficult well, too. Very good too. Very, <laughs> but very good to see you both, and thank, thank you, you for your input to the program. Um, there we are. I'm Stephen Galpin. So I hope you've enjoyed the show. Join me next time on Property Question Time. Yeah.